Hello, I'm Fern Britton and welcome to Cornwall on this very special Good Housekeeping Day. It's very nice to talk to Good Housekeeping readers and I'm a reader as well of Good Housekeeping so I've got some fantastic questions from some of you which I'll answer shortly. But um, I thought I'd just set you up as to how much I love Cornwall. Um, all the books I've written so far and I've just published number nine, um, have all been set in Cornwall because it's somewhere that I truly feel at home in. So ever since I was little, I've been coming on holiday here, wonderful holidays with my mother, my grandmother, my uncle, my aunt, my cousins, my sister, and we'd all be stuffed into two cars and follow each other down before motorways, you know, it would take eight hours from, well, we were just west of London, it would take eight hours to get down. And when we would be crossing Dartmoor, if it was a foggy day, which sometimes it was, when you drive past Dartmoor Prison, my mother would be telling us stories about the headless horseman who'd be appearing in the mist and go sinking into the bogs. And if we did ever stop by the side of the road and have a look at the ponies, she'd always say, don't go running off, you'll sink into a bog. And look out for escaped convicts, <laughs> and all of those things. And there was one wonderful summer when uh, there were police checks on the road across Dartmoor because somebody had escaped and my mother said well this is exactly the kind of car a convict would disguise himself in because it would be a, a family car so of course that's the best way for him to escape and go well I'm just on holiday with my family just an ordinary man so those sort of things that the excitement would build and that was only in Devon. Imagine when we crossed the border and got into Cornwall then it was all look out for the pixies and all of that stuff. We always used to stay in Loo, which I'm sure most of you or many of you will know, a beautiful little old fashioned seaside town and um, excellent fish and chips, wonderful little beach, uh, well quite a big beach actually, but when I was young and, and going there, there really was a Punch and Judy man on the sand and he'd walk up and down on his stilts every afternoon just before the first um, show and gather all the children, we'd follow him as he walked along the sands on his stilts and sit and watch him. and amazing speedboat rides around the bay and that's when I decided I was going to be a speedboat driver. I still want to be a speedboat driver but it's not going to happen now. And then a little ferry that took you across the river from West Loo to East Loo and back again. Uh, and in those days I think it was for threepence or sixpence or something. It's probably about 40p now, I don't know. Um, and there was a, there's a beach, quite a rocky beach in Cornwall with fabulous, uh, in Loo, sorry, with fabulous caves and wonderful rock pools and my mother she would drop treasure in the rock pools for my sister and I to find so I thought they really were you know treasures from Spaniards who'd shipwrecked on the beach in front of us and she'd actually have gone into the little um, toy shops and all those sort of shops and, and buy little rings you know little girls rings that were plastic and squeeze them together and she'd put those in the rock pool and she put threepenny bits in and we'd spend hours combing <laughs> these beautiful rock pools and finding treasure and finding um, hermit crabs and finding little shrimps and crabs never did really bit scared of crabs but um and then since then once my children grew up we would go back to Loo in fact we we tried to do it most summers drive over to Loo from where we're on the north coast now and Loo's on the south coast and um uh, we take the family and all my children have <laughs> been brought up sitting on the quay on the harbour quay in Loo with uh, the crab lines and a chunk of bacon on the end of the hook and on an incoming tide, that's the important thing, on an incoming tide, the crabs come with the tide, you see. Put it over the thing and catch as many as you can. And we'd say, right, there's an, there's an hour, there's a clock on the, uh, on the side of the harbour. And we'd look at that and say, right, it's four o'clock. Let's start now. And we'd crab until five o'clock. And then each of the children would count the buckets of crabs and um, whoever won. The, the many, there was a winner for the many crabs, the biggest crab, the tiniest crab, and then carefully put them back in the water. The um, harbour commissioner is very good about that. He says, don't just chuck them over the side because it makes them dizzy. They're caught a dozen times a day. So just carefully put them back in the water. They're living creatures. And we'd do that and they'd scuttle off down the slipways and into the water. Uh, not the children, the crabs. <laughs> and so you can see in my mind's eye that Cornwall is very much a character in its own right. 
this is where I first felt, you know, the cool of evening sand under my feet. The warmth of the day just keeping it a little bit warmer than the air, but it was still cool on your toes. And the lapping water and the gentle waves and then the days that there were storms. Um, oh, there's another thing my mother used to say, right, look out for submarines. <laughs> I'd be sitting there for hours waiting for the periscope to pop up and kept so yes I've seen one there you go um so Cornell is a character and I was lucky enough when I first started in television to uh, work at Westwood Television which is in Plymouth which is in Devon but I insisted that I found somewhere to live in Cornwall so every day I would come over the Tamar Bridge between Cornwall and Devon and I found a lovely little cottage to live in uh, I was about 22 at the time little cottage that I rented from a farmer and his wife. Idyllic. I mean, I thought I'd landed in heaven, which I had. Um, but the farmer and his wife next door, Tom and Chris, they were the sweetest people. And in strawberry season, they grew strawberries, they were market farmers. If, every time I opened my front door in the morning, there would be a punnet of strawberries for me. There was another woman in the village uh, who made her own clotted cream in her kitchen. And uh, you could go and buy a punnet from her, a pot from her. And uh, Pearl, the newspaper lady, she would deliver the newspapers just about a hundred yards up the lane from my cottage in a drain pipe. So it was a sort of, you know, terracotta drain pipe wedged in the hedge. And that's where she'd put the newspaper to keep it dry. <laughs> um, it, it, that was only 1980. I say only, it's 40 years ago, isn't it? Which is a, like a generation, but it was, it was, just lovely and I worked in television down here and I learned how to be started to learn how to be a journalist and a reporter and a newsreader and I made some glorious friends and by sort of osmosis I became considered almost local almost local so when my career took off and I went to London and went all over the place I missed it like nobody's business down here and as soon as my children arrived I booked, a, <laughs> I booked a big static caravan down in Cornwall and brought them all down and we would sit in that caravan for about five weeks all through the holidays, no shoes, lots of food, lots of running around, very safe on this gorgeous campsite, a beautiful little beach. And then maybe that was when the first of my stories started to come into my head. My garden here in Cornwall is small. Um, which I did have a much bigger garden uh, when I was near London, but I think actually I, I'm in, I mean, I loved that garden and I do miss it on one hand, but on the other, this garden is exciting because I can do something else. There are different plants that enjoy being in Cornwall. So come with me, for instance, look at these agapanthus. I mean, you can see they've actually been out for a couple of weeks, so they're getting a little bit, um, they're going over a little bit. But they're the most glorious things, aren't they? And then you come around here and I've got some nice tobacco plants that I grew from seed and some, I think these are marguerites. What do you think, these little white daisies? I think they're marguerites. Can you see those all right? And then look, the white agapanthus are coming now. As I said, I've got some more around the corner we're just about to come. So I've got some that are early, middle and late, which was a happy accident, really. Gorgeous. Um, <laughs> I do need to cut this, but I haven't quite got the ladder out yet to cut this jasmine. And then, oh, my little stool here. I got some peonies from Tesco's. <laughs> so they should be all right for next year, I think. And these, this daisy thing, um, those of you who know it will be in love with it. Aragon or Erigeron or Erigeron. It just grows everywhere and self seeds. And down here, everybody has it foaming out of their walls. And when a friend of mine said to me the other day, I'm a bit late to this party. I'm gonna have some of these soon. So uh, ignore the weeds all in here. And look, just, just a big pot of thyme that's sitting there. And these are cuttings from my geraniums last year. Now, are they geraniums or pelagoniums? Hmm. They keep changing the name, don't they? more of the serigaron and so it goes on I got this look at this beautiful alabaster cherubs well plastic from TK Maxx excellent um, oh the usual old castor oil plant and stuff but then if you can oh look 
Here are the self-seeded erigeron. See, I put them in the cracks last year. I let them go and I'm hoping they'll keep coming. Obligatory lavender and whatnot. We've been <laughs> done a bit of beach combing, got some lobster pots. I stuck an ivy in there, but only in the last couple of weeks, but he's starting to grow through. So that'll be quite fun, isn't it? And loads of these pine cones. We've got a big pine tree behind me and these come off in the winter and I collect them up. I gave some to a friend of mine for Christmas last year for her fire. She liked those. Uh, big clematis, more of the same, more of the same. Um, I, I bought this last year, a nice little bird bath. It's lovely, isn't it? Just, I haven't quite, as you can tell, I haven't quite got the design right, but I thought you'd just like to know how things are. <laughs> this is it, isn't it? This is the way it is. And then a bit of grass here. <laughs> so, my daughter Winnie, turns out she's absolutely dead eye dick. She's taken some archery lessons and she's, the instructor said she was very good. Not only that, um, she, obviously only for clays and things, but she can fire a 410 really well. So, a friend of mine is um, an ex-police firearms officer. So she said, oh, bring, bring Winnie over and we'll have some fun. So look out, keep your heads down. And then this lovely apple tree here. He's doing very well. They're just coming through. It's, what are we now? Just past the middle of July. And um, these are Bramleys, so good cooking apples. And they are award winning. Last year, I put them into the village show. They came first. Yeah, yeah. And I will tell you, if you want to make a good apple crumble, the recipe to use is right here, Phil's book, Proof of the Pudding. This is his first proper cookery book and puddings are his thing, you know, that's his thing. And here's the picture. Actually in the book, it's gooseberry crumble, but you can obviously change it all. But the thing about his crumble is two thirds crumble, one third fruit, which is a kind of combo I like. And he says that you can have custard, ice cream and cream because the heat with something cold is great, you know. So that's Phil's book. I might, it's a bit of a treasure now. I might be out of print. So let's look it up, see if you can find it. It's got everything in there, pudding wise. So that's my apple tree. Oh, don't look at the washing line. <laughs> Quickly whiz, but ask. Oh, I know what I'll show you. Come here, come here, come here. Next door's dog, excited. Look at my sweet peas. I cut a load of them the other day, so uh, but you see all the buds there. They were from seed. I started the seeds in October and they went mad and, and they were so tall, I had to keep cutting them down, even when they're in their seed tray. And then I planted them out and they've gone mad. So I'm pleased with those. And I just made this little bit here. I laid these little bricks and just stuck a load of um, compost in and there you go. And this was, these are quite sweet, these little bricks that have been painted. I think it's a work of art, probably, but I've just put them here. Uh, Cornish cream teas. Oh, that's all it says. With a VW in the teapot and a cow. <laughs> so I've gone very Cornish down here. I have my lover. And then, of course, we've got... Oh, there's the cat. He's interesting. And then here, mint. Winnie's brilliant on the herb garden, so we have to do a little herb garden. So she's got mint, uh, she's got some chives, she's got some, where are we? Oh, there is some rosemary. Oh, rosemary. And what's that one called? Oregano, I think. Yeah, oregano. More thyme. Catnip for the cats, because they just, oh no, that's catnip, isn't it? The cats just love this. They, they, <laughs> They go all surf dude when they've heard those. And some strawberries that um, Winnie brought on from seed. They're coming, but they're, they're a bit slow, but they're all, you know, brand new babies really doing their thing. And that's that. And here's my late, my late uh, Agapanthus. So they're gonna come through for all of August. So I'm pleased about that. So there you are. It's not exactly superstar, is it? But it's, really lovely and I love it. Oh, I didn't show you the ferns. Come here. So, this is bits of garnet, garden furniture that have gone, that don't sit on it because you'll go straight through. But I bought these great big ferns 
and I thought, well, they'll be shady in there and a bit damp. There's another one there, and I've got a third one. It's not here yet. And um, you know Prince Charles at um, Highgrove? He has a fernery and a stumpery where he puts all the fallen logs that they don't need, builds it up high, lets all the insects in there who just eat and munch and make their homes. And on top of that, he's grown lots of ferns. So it's kind of my fernery, not stumpery, but chairery, if that makes any sense at all. All right, I'm going to answer some of your questions. Come on. Bobby, get off there. Thank you for sending in questions. I've got quite a few of them. I'll answer them fairly quickly. Um, have you already decided on the ending of your novel before you write the beginning? That's a good question, actually. Generally, I do know how it's ending. I usually think um, when the story comes to me, which comes after a lot of sort of just letting your head whirl, then suddenly you get it and you go, yes, beginning, middle, end. So generally I've got that. And then I make a little map of say 40 chapters and roughly what's gonna happen in each chapter. And then off I go. Of course you go off piste in the middle and then think, where am I going next? And you come back to that list and think, oh yeah, I was gonna do that. So that's what I do. Um, do I ever suffer from writer's block? And if so, how do you overcome it? I think writer's block is something that one should never entertain the idea of, you know, don't don't make any contact with it because it would give you it. It's, uh, I, I just try not to, just try not to even think about it. And if there are days when it's hard to write, and there are days when it's very hard to write, I just relax and just write anything, anything. And it's surprising when you come and review it the next day, you think, Oh, that's quite good actually and I can work with that and the old subconscious takes over so um yeah I just don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to even go oh, I've got writer's block because it's like saying you know you've got some terrible illness when you haven't really but you think you have and therefore you get all the symptoms you know um do you ever base your characters on real people you know and do you worry that they will recognize themselves in the books <laughs> hmm. I think there are circumstances that I've seen happen that I can you know address with a huge dollop of fictionalization and uh, that works very well as for people I could never write about people I really know I, I just couldn't do it when I'm when I go on the big cycling tricks trips with these lovely women I've been cycling with for I don't know 12 13 14 years uh, they all go, oh, you must write this in a book. I said, I would never, could never write about you because you'd all know. And it'd be all right if I was doing a proper non-fiction, but no, I couldn't do it fictionally. Um, what's the novel that you've read that you really wish you had written? I think anything by Kate Atkinson. Oh, Kate Atkins? Kate Atkinson, yes. Uh, a God in Ruins, for instance, I think is one of the most, for me, one of the most perfect books. I really enjoyed it and my heart and head were completely emotionally involved with the characters. Um, I would also honestly have liked to have been productive as Enid Blyton. Her imagination was just second to none and after she was trashed during the 70s, I don't know if you remember, you know, she was taken out of libraries because what she wrote apparently didn't stimulate children's imaginations. What a load of rubbish. It's brilliant. So I, w I would have loved to have written anything akin to, you know, the Twins of St. Clair's and um, the Secret Seven and the mystery books and the adventure books, even Noddy, you know, and of course, the Magic Faraway tray, a Tree and the fishing... At can't speak today. The magic faraway tree and the wishing chair. Top, top, top books. Uh, which word or phrase describes how you feel when you are writing? <laughs> Mostly two words, probably exhaustion and terror. Because <laughs> all the time you're writing, if you're not already so concentrated on it that your subconscious is writing it for you and you're just going which is the that's the cream it's just when you're in you're in your rhythm and it's just happening there's a wonderful but then the days when you look at it and you think 
I have no idea where to go. I have no idea why she's up a tree. I have no idea why he's come back. Um, those, yeah, it's frightening and it's tiring. It really makes your brain hurt. Then you have to either go for a cup of tea, eat a packet of digestive biscuits, obviously, um, or just go and have a sleep for a bit and come back. And if it's still nothing there, then wait till tomorrow. You know, that's the only way that I can do it. How do you anticipate incorporating the pandemic into your future writing? Or do you think you'll avoid it? I honestly think I'm going to avoid talking about or writing about the pandemic because I think it's so close up to us all that it's going to take some distance needed for us to be able to get an overview of what really happened. That's the only way I can describe it for myself anyway. And also I think there will be quite a few books being written about it now, probably by much better writers than me. And so I'm going to leave that alone. It's uh, it's a bit too fresh and I think I would like a little bit of escapism from it. So I hope other people will too. And that brings you to well, my, the, the book for this year, 2020, is Daughters of Cornwall, uh, which thank you so much. It's It's been a huge success and I'm so grateful because it took me a while to get through this book. This was a really exhausting book to write because I didn't have such a great year last year. It was difficult, but um, I'm so thrilled it's done. And it is in memory of my grandmother who, when she was 18, 20, uh, sometime in the First World War, maybe towards the beginning. We don't know, she covered her tracks so well. But anyway, she was unmarried and she was pregnant. And I know her mother had died already. And she had a little boy and she had to give him away and none of us knew it. She took it to her grave. And it was only in 1980 when I was working down here, my first job in television, that that little boy, now a grown man, married with his own family, wrote to me and said, uh, this is gonna come as a shock, but I think your mother's my sister and I think your grandmother is my mother. And it was extraordinary. And he sent, because I had to have proof before I told my mother, so he sent me photographs of him and my grandmother on the beach, him as a tiny little toddler, um, letters from her to his adoptive parents, his foster parents. She arranged a private fostering because in those days, no social services. And so she gave him to a family who loved him and looked after him as far as I know. And her letters were full of love to the parents saying, I'm so glad to hear news of him and I'm so glad he's well and I close a five pound note to keep you going for his expenses. and wonderful and then suddenly all the letters stopped um, and she wasn't in contact again and it was probably because she'd met my grandfather and went on to have her I don't like to say legitimate family but you know what I mean uh, and it, it's a very sad story but I wanted her to be I wanted her to know that there was nothing wrong that she'd done nothing at all and that she was a wonderful grandmother, a very good mother to the children she was allowed to be a mother to. And um, to all of us an inspiration. She was a tough, strong, loving, kind woman. And I have many memories of her. Most of all, <laughs> lying on the floor of her small lounge, watching the wrestling on a Saturday afternoon. She loved the wrestling and counting the buttons in her button box. So that was my grandmother, known as Nana by us all. And she was absolutely wonderful. So there we are. I hope that's answered some questions for you. If I've blathered, I do apologise. Um, and I wish you such a happy summer and such health and happiness as well and that all is going well for you. And if it isn't going for so well for you, know that all things do pass. I know that from experience. Things will pass and life moves on and we enter different chapters. So look at it like that. But lots of love, happy summer holidays, and see you soon. Bye.